Thanks, Brendan. Uh, as Brendan mentioned, I, uh, I'm a manager at uh, Vanguard, which, as uh, Brendan also mentioned, mostly known for its uh, low-cost mutual funds. Uh, we have many uh, lines of business. Uh, I work in the retail or consumer line of business, so that's the backdrop for what I'm going to be talking about today. Our user experience at Vanguard is fairly well established. We've been uh, sending people uh, pieces of paper and talking to them on the phone for many, many years. We've had a website of one form or another for about 15 years. And it's very, very important to us, especially the online aspects, because the online channel handles most of our client interactions. And because it's important to us, we spend, even though it's pretty good and done quite well for us over the last 15 years, we spend a lot of time trying to improve it. That can very often feel a little bit like this. Um, lots of projects in flight at the same time, each trying to make their own improvements to the user experience, um, sometimes sequentially to the same parts of the experience, uh, sometimes even simultaneously to the same parts of the experience. Let's uh, continue the flight analogy for a, a second and um, just imagine that Vanguard turned its hand to aircraft design. Just let's pretend one of our teams was asked to redesign uh, this aircraft so it could carry more cargo. So they may well redesign it and turn it into something like this. Then maybe a little bit later, another team comes along and tries to redesign it um, to have more passengers. So they might design something like this. Then another team comes along and decides that speed is very important, and so they redesign it something like this. Then perhaps a little while later, moments before a deadline, another crack team of information architects comes along, and perhaps they might design it something like this. <laughs> and so on. Well, we have this problem at Vanguard. Each of our projects gets so focused on their particular improvement that they lose sight of the big picture which is that any experience has to balance the needs, many needs of users and many needs of the business. But prior to now, we've had no tool for having this conversation about these balancing many needs, apart from arguing about the design. So we would show designs to our business sponsors, for example, and they would routinely <coughs> take it upon themselves to redesign them. They'll say, no, no, put that thing on the right, or move that up the page, or um, set it on fire and make it spin round, or things like this. They're really just trying to express their priorities for their project, which results in the priorities for our experience changing over time and becoming very, very schizophrenic. Unfortunately, though, this isn't the only problem we have at Vanguard. Is this a good web page? How about this one? Is this a good web experience? Is this a good iPhone app? Is this a good drive-through experience? Well, I can't tell you. Because good needs to be evaluated within the context of what the experience was trying to do in the first place. And I didn't design any of these experiences. So while I can hazard a guess at some of these, I can't really tell you what they were setting, set out to do. Well, what about this one? This is a page from the Vanguard website. I, you'd think I'd be able to tell you if this was a good experience, right? Unfortunately, we have this problem too. We measure lots of stuff but mostly because we can, not because they're effective measures of whether or not the experience is good. 10,000 people hit this page last month, somebody will say in a meeting at Vanguard. Well, great. Was it good or bad? Did you want more people to hit the page or less people to hit the page? Were 100,000 people looking for it and only 10,000 found it? Uh, the 10,000 people that looked at it, did they all go away upset or did they get what they needed from it? Did their behavior change as a result of looking at this, at this page? We very rarely measure our user experience within the context of the objectives that it set out to achieve. And on the rare occasion we do, or the rare occasion the project comes along and does define a, a goal uh, or a metric against the objectives of the experience, the next project along defines a different metric. We've got no continuity of measure. Subsequently, we don't really know whether or not we're improving our experience over time. We can't learn from our successes, or more importantly, as Jared said, from our failures. So we have these two fairly fundamental problems. Uh, you know, projects becoming very focused and no big picture thinking, and uh, a lack of an effective way of gauging success for our experiences. We had previously thought that we had a fairly robust user experience uh, uh, process and techniques and tools. Um, this came as a little bit of a, as a shock to us, as, as Brandon said, a bit of a midlife crisis. And 
as we started to think about it, we started to realize that both of these problems shared a, same, a similar root cause. We didn't have any um, common language for describing the objectives of the experience that we were trying to design to. Now, what we've done is we've spent a lot of time over the last six months or so pulling together um, a lot of uh, years worth of research to try and create a, a framework that can foster this type of big picture thinking while being um, able to enable consistent and, and, and continuous measurement. The framework itself is um, easier to show than talk about, so I'm going to do that in a second. But just before I do, I just wanted to talk a little bit about a couple of terms that we'll be using uh, throughout. So we know that our users have goals. In our uh, case, retire at 50, send my kids to college, buy the extra beach house, things like that. And we know that the business, Vanguard, has goals. We want to keep costs down. We want to grow our assets. But these goals aren't that useful for us when we're designing experiences. They're too high level. They are, however, realized through tasks. Users want to do stuff so they can reach their goals, open accounts, look at their balances, see how much money they've made or lost in recent times. Um, and we, Vanguard, want users to do certain things so we can reach our goals. We want them to turn off paper statements, for example, because they're expensive, and that way we can lower costs and pass the savings along to the investors. We want them to roll over their IRAs or 401ks to Vanguard because that grows our assets and increases economies of scale. And it's these tasks, then, that are enabled and encouraged through our experience. We break our experience up into smaller chunks, manageable chunks called capabilities. But it's these capabilities that then help investors do the things they want to do and encourage them to do the things that we would like them to do. And these capabilities are cross-channel. I'm talking about a broader experience than just the web here. It's web, it's phone, it's print, mobile, TV, radio, in-person interactions if you're a brick and mortar organization. And it's these capabilities which projects then create and change over time. So let's take a look at how our framework is, is constructed. We mined all of our research. As I say, we've done lots of contextual inquiry and observations and focus groups and studies over the years. And we found 90 or so uh, discrete user tasks that represented the entire um, uh, life cycle of an investor at Vanguard, from a prospect completely unaware of the existence of Vanguard all the way through to a client being a client for 20 years. And we put them together and we organized them into these eight high-level categories. And on the other side, we did the same thing for business-driven tasks, things we want investors to do. We found about 45 or so that represented the full set, and we put them into these seven uh, high-level um, categories or groups. And in the middle, are all of our capabilities across channels. And we have a lot. We have, a, as I said, a very mature experience. We have 635 and counting. We find new ones every day. They're web, phone, paper. Each, we have a lot of forms. Each form is trying to satisfy certain tasks. Each form is a capability. Each web page or cluster of web pages is a capability. Each type of phone call that we have with, with our clients is a capability. Each type of phone call, not each phone call. This framework then allows us to create two distinct views or tools that we found very, very useful. One is focused on a single capability. And is very we call this the capability strategy sheet. And it's very useful for practitioners and designers on projects as they're designing these capabilities. The other is much, much broader and is more useful for managers or stakeholders because it shows the entire set of capabilities and how they satisfy user tasks. We call this the experience strategy map. I'll go into both of these um, in a little bit of detail. Let's see how we use the framework to create a capability strategy sheet. So let's focus on a single capability, which we'll call the rollover offer. It's a web capability. It's actually the screenshot from Vanguard that I showed a minute ago. It's about five pages on our website that helps somebody understand what a rollover is, why they should do one, why they should do one at Vanguard, and um, helps them get that process started. What we do is we look through the task model and extract out and identify all the tasks that we think this capability should try and satisfy. So it, one of our fir the first of the eight high-level groups was find an investment company. And there are four tasks within that. 
search for candidates, find out about Vanguard's reputation, explore our products and services, and find out about Vanguard's fees. Now, this capability doesn't have to satisfy the task of searching for candidates, because by the time you're looking at this, you already found us. Neither does it have to explore, help somebody explore a range of products or services, because you're only caring about rollovers at this point. But it does have to help the user understand who we are and what we stand for, our reputation. And it does have to help the user understand what our fee structure is. In fact, the tasks in the framework are written at a fairly generic level. For a specific capability, we often reword them. So we would reword that last one to be find out if there are any fees to do a rollover. Once you identify these tasks throughout the framework, you end up with between five and 20 tasks that this capability has to try and satisfy. It depends on the complexity of the, of the capability. We typically do this exercise in a very collaborative fashion with the project team. Uh, what we find works well is that each member of the project team spends five minutes looking through the lists and circling the, the tasks they think apply. And then we have a great collaborative discussion afterwards where you know, well, I think this one, you think that one, why don't you think this one? And we, it, it, get, it generates a really good uh, conversation. Once we have these tasks, we then generally put them on stickies, put them on the whiteboard, and prioritize them. I have to tell you that transition in PowerPoint took me about an hour to do, OK? <laughs> it's so good, I want to show it again. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I could watch it all day. Um, and we prioritize them, apparently 10 and 11, um, although on the slides, it's actually 1 through 11. Um, we tried doing high, medium, and low, but everybody makes everything high, so that doesn't work. So we, we, make, we force them into this ranking order. It doesn't really matter which one's number seven and which one's number eight, but what does matter is you have a discussion about which ones are most important. You know, if you only had to do one of these two things in the capability, which one, would you, which one would you leave off? And then you put that one beneath that one, and you work your way through. Again, a great collaborative discussion, because the different people in the room bring different perspectives and data. Um, somebody will say, well, this one's really important because it's a user-driven task as opposed to a business-driven task, and we care more about the users. Somebody will say, well, this one's really important because lots of people do this. Maybe this one's really important because perhaps it's the only place in the experience that you can actually perform this, uh, this task. So we get them into priority order. And then for each of these things, oh, and um, in some cases when you're having that discussion, um, some of these things drop off the bottom. You say, well, this is too many things for this single capability to do. Let's get rid of some of these so we can focus more. So sometimes they, they, they drop off the bottom. Um, and then for each of these tasks, we think about the emotional considerations that the user might be feeling, a high-level design approach and solution, and the success criteria for how we'll know whether or not we're satisfying it well. We'll pick on uh, get information about investments as the, as the one to go through as the example here. Um, we thought it was very important to bring the emotional aspect in at this stage because this is a very task-based model, but we know that people aren't just robots blindly performing tasks on our experience. Um, how they feel about the tasks that they're, um, that they're doing really affects how they approach it and certainly affects how we approach the solution for it. If somebody's checking their balance and they're worried that they're going to be able to retire, then that worry can certainly affect um, you know, the language and tone we use when we're talking to them in our content and our, in our design choices. So in order to make this easier for us, we created this little set of emotions. And this isn't a full set of all emotions in the world. It's just the ones that we think are pertinent to financial um, transactions. We didn't put love and hate on here, although some people may feel that. Um, so in this particular instance, where we're talking about getting information about investments so you can pick which stock or fund or, uh, to put your investments in, um, we, said, we, we might say that uh, the confused, informed uh, dimension uh, is uh, an interesting one because there's certainly this paradox of choice thing going on here um, with the amount of information uh, being overwhelming. Then we might put in a couple of sentences about a high-level approach if we're thinking of how we might solve this particular task and this capability. In this case, we may say, well, we'll provide some summary level of information about investments here in this rollover capability. But then we'll contextually link people to the full area of the site where we let people dig in and research investments to their heart's content. Investments specific to rollovers. And then, most importantly, I think, um, the success criteria. We need to know over time whether or not we're satisfying this uh, task well. We, we, this, has taken us, this is probably one of the most difficult things that we found when coming up with these capability sheets, is coming up with specific, relevant uh, success metrics to decide whether or not, when we're live with this capability in production, we're, we're satisfying it well. 
It's very much art versus science. So we may say in this case, um, if we're putting these contextual links into the body of this capability, if somebody's going to go and look at our other investment area, we want them to use those links versus the global navigation links because the global navigation links won't provide them investments specific to rollovers, the contextual ones will. So we may say if someone's going to use those or go that path, go this way versus that way. Now this, we do this for each of the 10 tasks in the capability and that basically is the capability sheet which then enables you to do some interesting things with it. Again, some of the numbers on the diagram are missing here but I'm gonna highlight them in a second. So um, you can put your priorities against your uh, designs. This is the screen we looked at earlier which represents the actual production version of this page or capability in, uh, on our website. And you can see that if I highlight that's four and five, uh, it's the process and benefits of rollovers and learn how we can help you do a rollover. That's, that looks to be very much what this capability is out. There's a lot of about. There's a, a lot of body copy um, about those two tasks. There's a couple of navigational elements. The most important capability, the most important task, I'm sorry, most important task is way over on the right. The actually get started doing a ro rollover. There's a link and a, and a phone number over on the right there. Now that could be okay. All of us design professionals in the room know that you can't just design your page to reflect the linear order of what's important because people in this case aren't ready to do a rollover yet. They want information. But this at least provides a framework for rationalizing those decisions with stakeholders and sponsors, which we found very useful. Um, this one's interesting, though. Uh, get investment recommendations and get information about investments. Vanguard is an investment company. We sell investments. People like to buy them from us. They like information about them. They like to know why they're great. Yet, and this is the second and third most important thing in this capability. Yet, in the screen on the right, it's buried in a single bullet in the middle of the page and one navigational choice. It really doesn't speak about the investments we have at all. This is something that, as a result of this process, is going to change in future ver versions of this, this capability. And this one, learn about the Vanguard story, the fact that we're client-owned, so all of the savings go back to the investors in the funds isn't actually even on this page at all. It's definitely gonna fail at that one. So these capability strategy sheets, we found a lot of value in three specific ways. The first is that it really helps project teams understand the entire scope of what they have to do with the capability. Or, if they're just focused on improving it in one particular way, what not to mess up. It also helps sponsors stay focused on their responsibility helping us decide what the capabilities should do and the priority order of them, not telling us whether or not they like blue versus green or pink or whether they want it on the left or the right. And the third thing is it really supports controlled evolution of our capabilities over time because it gives us this stable platform of measurement. Here's the thing, these sheets are not project sheets. They're about the capability because projects come and go, but the capabilities are always there. So it supports this continuous evolution over time. Now, the other view into the, uh, the model will be familiar for anybody that's uh, used or, or read about the mental modeling technique that Adaptive Path and Indy Young have used over years in that it puts the tasks of the experience across a very wide uh, document. Um, I'm showing one of our high-level task groups here, Monitor My Investments, and in our model, um, this has about 20 uh, tasks within it. I'm just gonna show the first four here. I'll read them so the people at the back can see. Check my balance, find out how much I've made, am I on track to reach my goal, and check the status of transactions. Into the body of the experience strategy map, the second view, we then put our different capability channels. So I'm showing three here. Vanguard's map has a few more, TV, radio, things like that, web, print, and phone. And into this, we then map the capabilities against the tasks they satisfy. And because as we just seen in the capability sheet, it was trying to do 10 tasks, the tasks will appear multiple times here. The, the capabilities, I'm sorry, will appear multiple times in this map. Statements, for example, not only tries to satisfy the task of checking my balance, but also, if I can get it to click in, it helps you find out how much money I've made. And many other things aside. And because we have measures and success criteria from the capability sheets, we can lay them in here too, in terms of red, green, and yellow, as how, how healthy each of those things is, how well it's satisfying that task. And you can see that while the statement may be really great at checking my balance, it might suck at finding out how much money I've made. 
So this becomes very dashboard-like, very health check-like. You can use it to see how well your experience is satisfying your client tasks across capabilities, across channels. We think this has got two uh, very useful um, benefits. The first um, is that because it shows uh, capabilities across channels and how well we're satisfying the tasks, we can use it to, for example, uh, check that we're being consistent, as consistent as we want to be, handling the check my balance uh, task across our different capabilities, for example. But really, the biggest benefit, and the one that we think has the most potential for this, is that because it shows the health of the entire experience, our sponsors and stakeholders and senior management can use it to determine where we should start to spend money on improvements. It's obviously not the only thing that they use. What's the point of fixing a poor capability if no one's using it? So you need to take into account you know, volumes and how much it's going to cost to fix those things and many other factors. But it is a critical factor in showing whether smoke in the experience. Now, we have these two tools. How is this being received and this framework? How is this being received in our organization? Um, I don't see too many glazed looks, but I'd be lying if I told you that um, we didn't sometimes get this uh, kind of, holy shit, that is really, really complex reaction. Um, but really, when you look at, I'm sorry, I didn't warn you about the polymath thing. Uh, when you look at the, uh, this model, framework by uh, capability by capability, it's actually surprisingly simple to use now that we have the framework. We've had project teams with no prior knowledge of, um, of this model uh, create capability strategy sheets in a matter of a few hours and get a lot of great conversation and discussion um, out of the process. And that's actually how we're rolling it out across our organization. We're, we're specifically just targeting certain capabilities and project teams, working very closely with them, coaching them through it so that they can organically spread the, spread the message. And it's not just a tool for user experience professionals. Our business colleagues are critical players when determining which tasks a capability has to satisfy and the priority order of those tasks, which is great for us because we really need them to spread this idea throughout our organization. I know I'm going to get some flack when they see this slide back at the uh, back. Out. <laughs> We're also trying to affect a bit of a more organizational and cultural change. We're trying to help our business sponsors to reframe the project briefs they write at the beginning of projects into this language of tasks and capabilities and away from add this link to this page. We're really trying to help them reverse engineer their design solutions out of the project charters and tell us what task they're trying to improve. And then we can figure out which capabilities might be the appropriate ones to, um, to address that task. We'd love for them to be written that way in the first place, but obviously that's going to take a long time. It's something we're slowly working our way towards. And finally, although we started off with two very discrete problems, and the solution that we came up with, this framework, pr let us produce these two tools to solve some of these problems we're having, it's really done something much, much more, much more profound, really. It's, it's really helping our teams because it's removing barriers of communication. It's really fostering talking between our team members of very different backgrounds, IT, business, user experience. It allows them to come into rooms and collaborate more and really act as the, the, the collaborative teams they're supposed to be working towards shared goals. Now, will this work for your organization? I'm not sure. If your organization uh, shares some of the same problems as ours does, um, then maybe it will. Namely, uh, you have a fairly m uh, mature and established user experience, and you know quite a lot about the tasks and capabilities that, are, that it comprises, um, and an organization where continuous measurable improvement is important, then it might well work for you. If you do decide to take it back to the, to the office and try it out, I'd love to, to hear from you. Thank you.